Hello, my name is uh, Bud Blake. I'm Thurston County Commissioner, and I am the chair of the Board of County Commissioners uh, this year and the chair of the Behavioral Health Organization. And today I wanted to talk about a subject that's very dear, near and dear to my heart, uh, and especially for the county wide. Um, as we know, um, there is a growing population. Um, people come and go, but there is a growing population here in Thurston County. And we'll talk about Mason County too and its population. Um, but for Thurston County, there's approximately 260 to 280,000 people, give or take a few thousand. Uh, with that in mind, there, with that uh, increase in people, um, you have to have systems of systems, uh, either from a government side, nonprofit, or profit side. Um, but from a government side, we look at it in terms of being able to handle those who um, need um, a place to go to to get mental uh, assistance. And we have here in Thurston County one of the best. And so uh, I'll talk a couple, about a couple of programs with some of the experts as we go along with this in terms of the law enforcement assisted diversion program. Uh, the triage center here in Thurston County and triage center in Mason County and I'm so f uh, fortunate to have this uh, forum to be able to discuss that because it's, um, it's something that helps not only for the general public but for law enforcement as well. As I mentioned uh, I am the chair of the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization and so with that in mind there's uh, two other commissioners that sit on the uh, board. Another one is from Thurston County and the other one is from Mason County. I say that because we have excellent staff of people who handle those who have um, mental health issues and substance abuse, substance abuse issues. But in that also we have a system what we call the, the triage and we have one here in Thurston County and we're building one in Mason County. And that is absolutely wonderful because it helps um, for example a scenario would be if a person is caught tagging and the law enforcement is called to the scene and a behavioralist, behavioralist is called to the scene uh, we can then do things differently than say take them to the big jail and hold them overnight and use that as a as a place to do treatment and what have you. So we have the triage set here in Thurston County and with that comes the law enforcement law and justice component of that and I have Mr. Wayne um, Graham here he's going to talk about a little bit how that works within the triage um, center here and particularly the acronym LEAD L-E-A-D which is Law uh, Enforcement Assisted Diversion and so, Wayne, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll talk about the LEAD program and Great, how you got involved. Great, Commissioner, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Wayne Graham. I'm with the Thurston County Prosecutor's Office. I'm a senior deputy there. I've been with the office since 2000. And uh, recently, John Thunheim had asked if I'd become part of the, the LEAD program uh, to try and see how we could get it further along than maybe where it was. It's, it's always difficult when you start initiating new programs, but the Triage Center is a resource that I know law enforcement was very interested in utilizing. And so it was an opportunity to hopefully engage law enforcement, educate law enforcement for another really tool in their tool belt. So instead of just like you had mentioned, if there's a, a criminal act, uh, the normal process for law enforcement would just be to arrest and book and then right. they're in jail and, and away we go. And so the triage center allowed uh, law enforcement a, a specific place instead of the jail to take some folks. And so uh, you indicated a, a tagging incident. Um, oftentimes they don't even have to necessarily be uh, in, in in essence committing a crime. They right. could just be in crisis mm -hmm. and of course law enforcement is the initial responders oftentimes mm -hmm. uh, and so it uh, not only is a, a civil opportunity but a criminal one as well and one that I know our office supports because um, as you indicated the mentally ill uh, need a little different approach. approach exactly, it's a good approach, yes. And, and uh, there are some unfortunately you know the jail is that net at the bottom of the of the silo, so to speak, mm -hmm. the jail has to catch everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think what I know our office and, and law enforcement appreciates is let's see if there's an opportunity before they get down to the net to keep right. them from getting there in the first place. You bet. And so uh, that's really what the program, it, it, we got our insight up in Seattle um, and brought it down to Olympia or Thurston County. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Commissioner, better than anyone, the dynamics in downtown Olympia are very different than they are in rural Thurston County. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement's response to those types of behaviors are very different. But the triage center is nice because it serves the whole county. It doesn't just serve the urban areas, and so the rural areas can take advantage of it as well. You bet. So uh, you mentioned a number of things in there, and so let's just kind of go back and, and pull some of it apart to be sure. able to, for the viewing audience to understand. Law enforcement on the scene, can you walk us through kind of a step-by-step -step in how they come to the triage center and your role as far as the, the justice of that? Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so law enforcement is obviously most oftentimes a proactive uh, response agency. Someone calls for some assistance, whether for themselves or for somebody that they see in crisis. So they'll arrive at the scene and they've received some special training in regards to hopefully being able to assess, is this a criminal behavior act or is this maybe a mental health driven behavior act? Mm -hmm. And so obviously there's some discretion there. And if uh, they're able to collect the information at the scene, they're able to contact um, either our mobile outreach unit, which is nice through telecare and having them come out and assess and provide some services, mm -hmm. or directly bringing them right here to the triage facility versus right next door to the jail. To the bigger jail. And right. so it's an opportunity uh, to prevent them from having to go through the, the booking process, but still receive some services and mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. um, still get them to a safe place. That's, I think, law enforcement's safe, main right. focus there is to get them where they're safe and then obviously the community's safe as well. Okay, so in theory, we have the person here at the triage center where we're sitting here. What is your role or the law and justice role as far as being an uh, integral part in the uh, even assessing the restitution, uh, the restitution and how the whole court system works for us. Walk well, us through that. And, and that's where um, we've developed kind of a new unit in our office, and I know we'll be talking about it a little later, called First Look. So basically any new arrest or new law enforcement contact that rises to a felony level mm. uh, will come across my desk. And so uh, w what we're hoping is if somebody is a lead referral to triage, that there's a law enforcement tick. So in essence, I get that case right up front. And then I can assess whether or not um, justice, so to speak, I guess, is served sure. by engaging the criminal system mm -hmm. or saying, you know what, as long as this person has gotten engaged with some mental health services, maybe that was our goal in the criminal system anyway. Right. And so maybe we kind of come off of the gas pedal, so to speak, mm -hmm. if they're able to engage with those mental health services, mm -hmm. maybe there's really nothing to gain by our office uh, filing sure. charges and going down the normal criminal mm -hmm. process. So it's an opportunity, hopefully, to still get some positive outcomes but without engaging the criminal justice system. So, yeah, so when you say engaging the criminal justice system, the larger criminal justice system. Exactly. Right, right. So there's kind of a miniature one here at the triage center. Is that a fair assessment in it terms is. of a prosecuting attorney, public defense, uh, court commissioner, and whatever law enforcement role in? Right, right. I should have mm -hmm. made, made that clear. When I say engage the criminal process, I usually involve a judge. <laughs> right, right, right. And so what's nice is exactly what you said, and I know you'll be talking with Patrick a little bit later. Uh, there's a, more of a collaboration. Uh, between the criminal partners, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, with the prosecutor's office, uh, the mental health providers, and the and the defense counsel, mm -hmm. and so there is an opportunity to engage, I guess, in the system, mm -hmm. but not have the formal processor like you referenced, the big criminal justice process. Sure, and so um, we've been doing this. We as a whole have been doing this, and so from a prosecuting attorney's standpoint, um, has it been beneficial to um, uh, have this branch now, a new branch, if you will, from the Prosecutor Turn Tunheim's um, perspective. You know, as anybody who knows uh, John or Mr. Tunheim, he is always looking for new avenues or new opportunities uh, to effectuate justice while always balancing community safety, and that kind of ties in with my earlier answer. If somebody is here and they're safe, then the community is safe as well. So it's a, a new tool for us um, in in seeking uh, more of a restorative or a rehabilitative. A component to criminal justice that mm -hmm. I think is a great opportunity, especially like we talked about, Commissioner, when you're talking about mentally ill folks, um, the old traditional system might not be the best way to go at modifying their behavior. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be, but the triage center and what everyone does here allows us another opportunity to hopefully get someone healthy short of having to go through that traditional system. You bet. So um, within the whole system of the triage center and the roles that you play, uh, tell me, me and the public a little bit about First Look. And I appreciate that, Commissioner, because it's a new program uh, in the prosecutor's office where it really ties in with the ideology behind the triage program. Oh, is, is there a different way of approaching uh, criminal behavior than, than what we've always done in the past, which is kind of just, can I prove the case? Let's make an offer if they don't like it. We can go to trial and then go to jail or prison. Okay. And, and there are times where that's appropriate for a particular offender. But let's make sure that we're using, using that system for the correct offenders. One mm -hmm. of the adages I think of first look is, you know, there are some people that belong in jail. And that's just the nature of our society. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure the right people are in jail. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure they're there for the time that they should be. Sure. Let's not have them there longer than they should be. And let's make sure that... Our, our jail population is really designed to effectuate yeah. community safety. And so first look is, yeah. mm -hmm. is giving us a chance to look at every new case that comes into the office and say, mm -hmm. is there a different approach here? Is ah. there a different way of looking at this case 
than right. we traditionally have. Mm -hmm. We focus on uh, low risk, low offense offenders, so mm -hmm. kind of lower level felonies and people maybe not with a lot of ton of criminal history, maybe there's an opportunity to effectuate some change in their behavior, mm -hmm. or frankly, the high risk uh, low offense offenders. Right. People have a lot of history, mm -hmm. but maybe are more substance abuse or mentally health, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness abuse, where they're maybe self-medicating with drugs. Sure. And so uh, there's an opportunity with the collaboration of the Public Defender's Office of saying, okay, are we arguing about the crime? Mm -hmm. And that's really the focus. No, you know, they, there's really no issue in regards to whether they committed the crime. Mm -hmm. It's what do we do with them now? Right. And I think oftentimes in the past, the consequence of admitting to the crime was so severe, people would say, oh, I'm, I might as well roll the dice and mm -hmm. go to trial. I've got no, no incentive mm -hmm. to, to negotiate. So what we've tried to do is say, look, if you're willing to own the behavior, mm -hmm. then let's work at a solution to make sure you don't come back. It's practical and reasonable and so, yeah, solution bound. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have, it, it has less to do with the amount of the consequence versus what the consequence is. Right. And so if we're tying in an opportunity for either mental health or substance abuse treatment or anger management treatment, domestic violence treatment, we want to try and remove the hurdles that are preventing that person from being successful. Right. And so it's identifying that through our office and frankly through the prosecutor's office or the, through the public defender's office, through pretrial services, mm -hmm. through all of the agencies that kind of touch somebody as they come through the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm getting as much information as we can so we can kind of formulate a resolution that uh, always protects community safety and holds mm -hmm. the offender accountable, mm -hmm. but also encourages them or gives them the tools that they need to be successful going forward so we don't have to see them again. Sounds like a great tool to have in the toolbox. Uh, reducing time and money and, and increasing the, uh, the, the person's uh, success rate as far as coming to the that's, system. That's the goal. And of course, there's the last question, the cost. The cost, not only dollars, but uh, tell me how large your staff is, and not just you, but how the, um, it's all tied back into the prosecuting attorney's office. You know? Well, we're, like I said, it, it's, it's just interesting because what we're trying to do is keep us out oh. of, of that particular component. So at this point, it, it's primarily myself, as long as we don't file charges, mm -hmm. and uh, some staff people that help me assist in just compiling numbers and things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of non-traditional criminal justice partners involved. I know you're going to be talking with Mr. Friedman a little bit later and mm -hmm. uh, for somebody to say that the prosecutor's office and, and, and the BHO are sitting at the same table is kind of an interesting yeah. concept for folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as we go forward, I think it's a necessary uh, collaboration. And Very I know so. Patrick will be talking a little bit later in regards to some of the roles that are uh, engaging in the prosecutor's office and the defense attorney's office that were maybe not what they would have been, say, five or ten years ago. They would have been more adversarial. And there's always a time where that's going to happen. Sure, it's probably, But let's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, let's, let's save the, the fighting when it needs to be. Let's see <laughs> yeah. if we can work together right. in maybe getting a positive outcome for both the community mm -hmm. and the offender, especially if they're suffering from some mental illness. There might be a real different way of going at that. So um, our expenditures at this point are really kind of personnel. Um, I know that Mr. Friedman will talk a lot more about as far sure. as the expenditures here at Triage. Yeah. I want to take the moment here to thank you and the uh, prosecuting attorney, the, uh, all the others that are behind you. Uh, what you do is for uh, assisting those who need help with the mental health, the triage center. Uh, thank you so much for coming today and explaining to the public and what we do here. It's been beneficial and greatly appreciated. Great. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you it. And our discussion on the triage center here in Thurston County and potentially in Mason County um, here in Thurston County, we have one of the critical components of the law and justice system. It's the pretrial system, pretrial services. And I have with me here Kelly McIntosh from the Thurston County Pretrial Services. Hello, Kelly. How are you doing? Hi. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about how big the, the section is and, and the role that you play and the role that the team plays as a whole in terms of the law and justice uh, system. Sure. Well, pretrial services has been a part of the Thurston County criminal justice system for more than 25 years now, mm -hmm. uh, probably coming up on 27 years. And um, we recently became our own department separate from the courts, so that's pretty exciting. It, it is gives very us exciting. A, yes. some new opportunities. Um, we have a new director, Marianne Clear, mm -hmm. who has been with us about a year and a half now, and we are a total of five individuals now oh, wow. in that department. Um, we have a lot of roles and responsibilities for the court with mm -hmm. a small staff, but we try to get the job done. Um, primarily what pretrial services does has two uh, primary functions for the court. Okay, what are they? Uh, they are investigations for the court mm -hmm. and supervision. 
And primarily what that means is that for folks who are arrested in, in felony uh, cases on warrants and probable cause cases, um, we have staff that are in the jail who go in and interview and provide a screening and investigation report for the court for those preliminary appearances and that uh, provides a lot of background for the judge as well as the prosecutor and the public defender in making a release decision, oh. uh, whether that's on a new probable cause or a warrant. Mm -hmm. And that information is used for setting bail, recommending release, um, as well as setting those conditions of release once they're in the community, whether they're bonded out or on right. personal recognizance. Mm -hmm. So that's one portion of it. The mm -hmm. other half of that is then when those folks are released from custody, uh, there is a significant number of those individuals who are then placed on community supervision mm -hmm. through pretrial services. And then the other half of our staff at the courthouse, then we um, oversee all of those conditions of release, uh, helping to ensure that they follow those conditions as well as get back to court and hoping to reduce the failure to appear mm -hmm. in court by being a reminder system mm -hmm. uh, for those defendants who are out. So five people, a uh, court system of judges and, and the uh, staff, and how many people do you see on a daily basis, hourly basis, weekly basis, and what's the, what's the volume of rate, um, the rate of volume? We actually have a high volume. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, in, in last year we kind of set a record number. We interviewed uh, at the jail over 2,200 people for mm -hmm. those preliminary appearances, mm -hmm. and we actually supervised approximately 1,100 people mm -hmm. on pretrial services supervision who mm -hmm. were out of jail right. waiting to come back for uh, future and pending court hearings. Right, a lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> for a lot of small staff yeah. there. Okay, and so for the triage center here, what is there a, a large role, small role? How, what role do you have here in ter terms of the triage center and helping out with the, law, uh, the lead program and what have you? What we do, um, we don't have a direct connection to the lead because the lead is more the pre-arrest. Mm -hmm. Pre-trial becomes involved once a defendant is arrested. Okay. However, we are the people who see those folks first. Mm -hmm. We see them before they even have you know, a bail or prelim preliminary appearance. And so at that time, we have the opportunity to see who they are um, and be uh, informing the public defender, the prosecutor, the court, of saying, hey, this person has a mental health issue, mm -hmm. letting them know ahead of time, maybe triage or something might be uh, more readily apparent and mm -hmm. need, mm -hmm. uh, even before they become the preliminary parents. Mm -hmm. Or um, look at a reentry program as opposed to, you know, a plan that gets them out of custody as soon as possible, but has resources set up. Mm -hmm. We're there kind of at the front end of the system to identify folks who not only have triage, but may have a mental health court opportunity, a drug court opportunity, or veterans court, mm -hmm. because we're trying to collect all that information about them personally, mm -hmm. and perhaps instead of looking at the regular path of prosecution, maybe divert them away uh, from that, or at least identify them early on, so when they're at arraignment, or at those first few hearings, saying, hey, there may be an opportunity here, because we're seeing them so often, mm -hmm. and we're seeing them on a weekly basis many times, mm -hmm. um, having that uh, that connection with them and that contact to keep them connected with the court so we don't lose them. And then that's that's when you get the fo those failure to peer rates. Fantastic. So you've been doing this 26 years almost? Almost yeah. 26 yeah. years. And what makes you um, continue something like that? What's your passion about the pretrial service? Um, the one thing that I really like about this job is two things. Um, it's very dynamic. No matter what, in all of these years, every day is not the same. There's always a lot going on. Um, the other thing is, is that over the many, many years I've done this, um, you get to know these folks. Oh. And, human beings, you yeah. know, you get to really know who they are. You know their stories. And the one thing is when you see them succeed and when you see all these therapeutic courts and you hear their stories, it's really actually pretty rewarding mm -hmm. to see them do so well mm -hmm. instead of sitting there going, oh, I see you back in jail Just again. One, huh? You see mm -hmm. folks who have been very successful in, uh, in diversion. You see them successful in mental health or drug court. And it's really rewarding to recognize that they can do it. It is possible. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming today and giving us some insight on pre-trial sure. services and the years of experience you've given and Marianne, uh, your whole team. Uh, thank you so much for what you do. Well, thank you. you thank bet. you so much. All right. Today I have with me Patrick uh, O'Connor. He is the Director of Public Defense for Thurston County. And I've asked him to come and talk uh, a little bit with uh, me and you as far as the Triage Center, in particular the Law Enforcement uh, Assisted um, Diversion Program. 
And with that in mind, uh, he plays, in his office, plays a critical role in terms of the public defense when we do bring someone to the triage center. And so I'd like to welcome you today here, Patrick. And how are you? Commissioner. How are you doing? Yep. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your the role as a public defense here in the triage center when we talk about um, diversion. Sure. Um, well, a little bit about myself. I'm a career public defender here in Thurston County. I've spent over a decade uh, defending um, our community's indigent uh, clients that are appointed to our department, uh, whether it be in a, a criminal case or we actually represent people in non-criminal cases as well. Um, our office has a, a role in this facility, in the triage facility, um, uh, in several different aspects. Okay. Um, in addition to representing uh, people accused of crimes, we also represent uh, other individuals in our community, specifically for this facility, those that are facing an involuntary treatment commitment through the Involuntary Treatment Act. Absolutely. Those are individuals in our community that are, uh, that are vulnerable, that um, suffer from a mental illness, that come here every day. Um, to, uh, to see a judge and determine whether or not uh, they should be committed to Western State Hospital due to an illness. Okay. Um, in addition to that, um, we also have a uh, collaborative project with the Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Um, that project is a diversion, mm -hmm. so those individuals who are arrested in our community that we're able to identify early on with an acute mental illness, mm -hmm. uh, we're able to collaborate with the Prosecuting Attorney early on to determine whether or not that case should go forward in a criminal setting or be referred to this facility to more of a civil commitment. Um, and um, so we're here a lot. Wow. That's an incredibly large role in undertaking here. And um, about how many people do you have involved in, in from your staff or, or other uh, public defenders? Uh, we have, um, I think, about 35 staff. Um, uh, a mix of uh, attorneys, about 20 lawyers and, um, and staff that are highly skilled, dedicated to, uh, to public service and to specifically public defense. Um, we um, are excited to, um, to be a part of this community and, uh, and, and play a role. We, put, we often play an invisible role, um, so to speak, in community safety, but these projects um, that um, uh, we've started discussing here with diversions, with, um, I've been working here, like I said, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't be more proud of what we've been able to accomplish in the last two years with what we're doing here at the triage for we, this community. We have come a long ways, haven't we? Yeah, sure have. We have. And again, as I mentioned, uh, you and your office play a critical role. Just kind of walk us through what a, a public defense uh, attorney does here and when a person is um, um, brought here by either law enforcement or behavioral. Just kind of give us a snapshot in time what, what that consists of. Sure. Well, if uh, they're being brought here for a potential involuntary uh, commitment, we have uh, an attorney that's dedicated, two attorneys actually, that are dedicated to representing those folks. They get um, sh they share information. Um, uh, they see the clients uh, this morning or any other morning. Um, they'll have a hearing that afternoon. They get to spend as much time as they can with the client um, and prepare for a hearing. Um, they uh, are uh, fierce advocates for their clients, protecting their constitutional rights, but um, but also um, there's a very humanitarian role um, that we play as well, trying to do the right thing for the individual, their family, and our community. I bet. And so when that happens and uh, kind of things go along as far as the protocols, um, do you go before the larger court or do you go before the uh, court commissioner that's assigned to here? Or does it, how does that work where you see a judge or a court commissioner? Yes. Sure. So um, for those involuntary treatment um, hearings, they would go before a commissioner mm -hmm. um, here. If um, the case uh, is in that other category that I referred to earlier, that um, a decision is made um, by the prosecuting attorney not to refer the case um, to, to this facility but to continue on with the criminal charges, then they would appear um, with a different lawyer from my department uh, to begin the um, criminal proceedings. Um, one additional thing uh, that is mentioned is the from the prosecuting attorney side is the first look. Uh, do you have a role in that? And if so, how does that, how does that figure in? Yeah, we certainly do. And uh, again, it's another exciting, um, these are all efforts to reform uh, criminal justice here in our Good. community. Um, absolutely. And uh, this was a concept that uh, Mr. Thunheim and I had discussed uh, last year and uh, we're still evolving, but the concept is you know, the three leading causes for people in our community that intersect with the criminal justice system isn't unique to us, but it remains uh, poverty, chemical dependency, and mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so first look is a concept for those individuals 
um, that are either new to the criminal justice system to offer them an opportunity to divert out of the criminal justice system mm -hmm. without a conviction so they can get employed, mm -hmm. contribute to our community for, um, uh, for a mistake that they may have made. Or, um, as Mr. Graham pointed out earlier, some of those individuals that we've seen repeatedly in our criminal justice system mm -hmm. and trying to make an effort to connect them with the services they need to li live a better life, to be frank. And, um, and, and largely, these types of programs will only make our community safer. And uh, we're committed, the prosecuting attorney's committed. Um, this is gonna be a, an exciting year. Yep. Um, Tell me a little bit about uh, any kind of particular case that you've seen go to success, just in, without using any of the privacy, using the privacy, just kind of walk us through what success looks like. Have you seen any of that? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, we have. Um, I ran in actually, that's uh, a good, uh, I ran into a client uh, very recently at Safeway um, who had been diverted. Mm -hmm. um, he was very young, um, made a mistake like we all do. We all have, um, yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, was, be, he was able to, um, to be afforded the opportunity um, to overcome that mistake. And he was able to overcome it without a felony conviction. Um, he's employed, stable, um, he's connected with his parents, um, and he's living a good life and he's contributing. So um, that's one thing that's great about Thurston County, as you know. Um, we are constantly running into our clients. And as Kelly mentioned earlier, um, there's nothing more satisfying for any of us in the criminal justice system um, to have those success stories. And we have a lot of them, and we hope to have more. You will. So, Patrick, you mentioned you have uh, approximately 35 attorneys here to associate with the Triage Center and obviously the staff, administrative staff that comes with that. Um, give me a little idea or give the public a little idea of some of the internal changes you've had to make here where, since you've been in charge of the, the, as a director of public defense for Thurston County. Sure. Um, well, we have um, uh, 35 staff. We have 20 oh, attorneys. There you but, go. I'm sorry. Um, there you go. Set me straight. Yeah. Well, you have Good. a lot of numbers, I'm sure, <laughs> thrown at you. Um, but uh, um, uh, this year in 2018, um, we were very fortunate to get some support um, from the board and, and you. I, I thank you for that. Um, we uh, added three felony attorneys, and those felony attorneys, as Mr. Graham pointed out, are really what we're targeting with First Look and these other criminal justice reform um, initiatives. So the additional um, staff in our office to meet the demand of, um, the way our office works is the court appoints us to represent individuals, okay. to represent uh, the vast majority um, of individuals accused of crimes in Thurston County. Um, because they fall below the federal poverty line. Mm -hmm. Again, there's that connection between income and the criminal justice system. And, um, and so that's been a huge addition. Um, we've already started looking at our first quarter numbers and we've really seen the impacts. Um, it's not just the impacts in the amount of cases we can take, it's also an impact in results. Results that um, you know, I firmly believe in justice delayed is justice denied. Mm -hmm. And so when we have our, are able to recruit and retain highly dedicated public defenders that are committed to our mission and our values. Um, that only helps our community and helps our clients. Um, and we've also um, increased uh, a couple other areas in our department. We've, um, such as? Such as mm -hmm. we've, um, we have uh, hired our first um, internal criminal investigator. Oh, great. Yes, so um, all our clients are entitled. Huge step. Yeah, mm -hmm. huge step. All the clients that we represent are um, entitled to independent investigation, and yep. so um, we've had that support. I thank you and the other commissioners for that. So far, it's been wildly successful. Um, we uh, have also added um, one support staff to support those three attorneys, mm -hmm. and um, beginning of next month, we will add a, um, an accounting assistant to help with our accounting department. Which is absolutely critical also to keep the numbers Very critical, straight. right. Very critical, absolutely. Okay. Well, I want to take a moment here to thank you for your leadership, looking internally and externally to taking care of the, uh, those who are involved in coming here to the triage and for Thurston County at, at, at large. You bet. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, today I have with me here uh, Mark Freeman. He is the CEO for Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization, and he plays such a critical role in making sure that the triage center here in Thurston County and potentially here in Mason County is fully operational with the staff that we have um, involved and working with the other partners such as law enforcement and particularly the prosecuting attorney, the public defense, and where occasionally the uh, pretrial pre pre services. So Mark, welcome here today. Thank you, appreciate yeah. the time. Tell us a little bit about you and your role here as the CEO of Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization. Happy to. Um, Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization is primary purpose 
is to work with individuals with behavioral health disorders at all levels uh, and continuum of the care. Most of our focus and population are those on Medicaid, but we handle crisis for anybody. When we talk about the continuum of care, that includes involuntary treatment, it includes outpatient, it includes uh, crisis services, medication, so the full gamut. We serve in a given year several thousand individuals um, throughout the whole year. Mm -hmm. So it uh, covers both Thurston and Mason County. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have you been in this kind of business? Huh? I've been here in Thurston County specifically for just about 21 years. Prior to that, I uh, did similar work down in Oregon. Before that, I was a clinical director at an outpatient agency. So you've so, seen a, a lot of changes? I've seen a lot of changes. And actually, this county um, I find quite remarkable. I have peers throughout the state doing similar work for their counties. And I got to say, I think it's, it's quite uh, positive and unique. The relationship of having the prosecuting attorney's office, defense counsel, the BHO courts, um, everybody involved, and and also law enforcement, the the patrol officer on the street, mm -hmm. um, how positive the experience has been of working together, mm -hmm. to recognize that when somebody has a, an acute crisis, uh, behavioral health driven, and they commit a crime due to their illness, now is the best outcome for that for them to take up a bed uh, in a jail, or can we treat them to reduce the incidence? Mm -hmm. So we've all been working very positively together to, um, one, identifying to be clear, we're not going to create a system that poses any additional risk to the community. That's exactly right. But we want to be able to treat people and reduce, uh, the outcome is reduce the chance of going to jail or even having to encounter law enforcement. Okay. So we, we have been successful with that. Very much so. So uh, a scenario, if I may, and I'll speed it up just a little bit in the sense that, that the behavioralist or the law enforcement brings a person here to the triage center. Mm -hmm. You mentioned treatment. Talk to us about a person who walks to the door and what kind of um, actions take place in terms of treatment and care and the whole process. Certainly. So um, first place, most likely the individual is not walking through the door. Okay. They're being brought in through the uh, sally port by the police or by an ambulance even on a sure. gurney. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're coming in into this facility. Uh, odds are they're coming in uh, in an involuntary uh, detention and most likely um, because in this particular facility there's, there's a great likelihood that they've encountered law enforcement uh, due to their actions or have even have a um, possibility of an arrest uh, occurring. They come in uh, first thing we do is medical clearance to make sure physically and everything else that they're safe and people around them are safe. Yep. And then we spend time working with them, get their history, uh, look them, one, to make sure and understand what medications they're on, and essentially it's doing a, a clinical assessment where we move into treatment. And this facility has um, both medical and clinical staff, okay. including a psychiatrist or an ARMP who would be involved in the assessment and doing a medication assessment as well. So there's a, a lot of our population that ends up when they become acute is because they've gone off their medication. Mm -hmm. We can get them back on, get them stabilized. We have a better chance also then of continuing treatment when they move out of this facility back into the community, which is absolutely critical. They don't come in here and resolve their issues by just moving out. We have to provide that cushion, that um, warm handoff for the reentry process uh, for them to move back into the community. Mm -hmm. And that includes also even individuals coming out of the jail. If maybe we did not treat them here, but coming out of the jail, if they have a major uh, uh, behavioral health issue, we want to follow them. We want to engage them. We want to make the system user-friendly for them so they engage in treatment and uh, we, we help further their stability in the community. Sure. Uh, a lot of partners uh, in terms of uh, making this successful, and you mentioned a few of them, but just in a short... Uh, Don't little, do anything short. Yeah, I know, just in a little bit. Tell us how that, how, on a day-to-day -day basis, how you have, you or a, a staff member has to work with some of the mm -hmm. partners. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things that uh, the BHO has evolved into is also that we are now a uh, licensed mental health agency. Right. And we have a couple of programs that are running, kind of doing essential, very specialized areas of care. And these staff 
a number of them are peer counselors, mm -hmm. individuals who have prior history themselves mm -hmm. and understand how to engage and be with uh, a client. Mm -hmm. They can be working with another outpatient agency that mm -hmm. where the individual goes for treatment. Mm -hmm. They can be w working with, uh, if it's a child, there are a number of child serving agencies. They work with Providence, St. Peter Hospital or any other hospital. Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about, other partners like uh, that. Mm -hmm. par and then uh, even some of them, we have staff down at the, the new uh, community the care, care center. center. Mm -hmm. uh, so we work hard to reduce homelessness. We work with uh, landlords, housing providers, mm -hmm. um, all the outpatient agencies, as I mentioned. And we are now working, um, really focusing on how do we integrate behavioral health care with primary care. Mm -hmm. So working with physicians, working with who else is taking care of the medical side of this individual's need, mm -hmm. uh, private or otherwise. Mm -hmm. But other c critical players, uh, one major one is the jail. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here and I've seen a couple different jail managers and understand different relationships with them. Right now, we're in a, an incredible uh, functional kind of relationship between us and the jail in terms of what occurs uh, with, um, they identify upwards of 40, even sometimes 60% of their population are dealing with mental health or substance use issues. So how we can work with them and then transition people out to agencies in the community, even other kinds of agencies that we're involved with. We have a great relationship with uh, Education School District uh, 113. Yep, as another part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 113. 113. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, that uh, works directly in the schools with our um, children and trying to do work up front, prevention work is critical so we don't even end up into this kind of situation. It's unfortunately that um, uh, the Medicaid funding we receive is not, does not focus on prevention in terms of when there's not an identified patient. Mm -hmm. That is critical and hopefully in the future that is something that can be developed. Okay. Um, but that's just a list if you want agencies names them. So we talked about process in the beginning and then mm -hmm. partners and some of the uh, programs and stuff. Um, Let's talk about a specialty there. I'm going to say the acronym, and you can go ahead and elaborate on it, the DMHPs and how that works. And just okay. kind of tell the viewing audience what a DMHP is sure. in terms of what the acronym stands for and how the, what their role is. Um, DMHPs, Designated Men Health Professionals, are actually now called um, DCRs. Um, update. <laughs> yeah. So of course they're, they're essentially focusing now on crisis response because of, it's not just... Um, mental disorders that they're responding to. They're also now responding to if a person is gravely disabled, dangerous self or other due to substance abuse. Mm -hmm. So that's being included now in their um, book of business, if you will. Sure. So their job is to go out when there's a referral. It could be at the hospital and emergency department, could be from police, could be from a community member, or could be from the community care center. An individual is so acute in their presentation that they're dangerous to themselves and staying healthy. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of individual we want to treat here so we can stabilize them. The DMHP, or now DCR, is the one that does that initial evaluation to determine mm -hmm. by law, um, can this person be detained um, and move into involuntary treatment. Great. And uh, how many in uh, just kind of the, how that, the history of that's been? Mm -hmm. Sure. So right now we're running between Thurston and Mason County um, approximately 15 um, staff, 15 FTEs, to do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are constantly on. And they cover the whole physical region and have to be able to respond and do an evaluation within a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, these staff are wonderful. They're well-trained. They got great supervision um, by our staff and they're the ones who are on the, the leading edge of being out there to first engage somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working hard with um, uh, law enforcement and our own uh, mobile outreach teams uh, to when they engage somebody, they identify is how do we coordinate with them and how do we work with them mm -hmm. where th the next step is to move towards involuntary care. Mm -hmm. so. Alrighty. Um, any particular successes that have uh, occurred here in, uh, recently that you'd like to talk about in terms of the Thurston Mason BA Behavioral Health Organization? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, 
some of the work we're doing now, um, well, there are several new projects that have started up. One mm -hmm. is called, um, pardon the names, so we don't have control of some of that, mm -hmm. but it's True Blood. True Blood. Where we are, have a grant um, now for where we have additional clinical staff in the jail doing assessments, mm -hmm. and then peer counselors working with individuals who have major behavioral health issues, move them out to connect with housing, to connect with treatment, and to stabilize them. And we have, we're reducing, even when we look at this facility, um, since this building has been um, up in the past year and a half, we've served over, we've served about 350 individuals. Those are individuals that would have otherwise gone to jail. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of an overall success, these are all people who were either reducing the length of stay or not even going at all um, into the uh, criminal justice system okay. and where we're, then we move them into treatment. So these services we have, uh, we're working on another one right now where we have a grant um, from uh, Department of Commerce for construction mm -hmm. of building a similar facility like this in Mason County. Right. That'll be between um, 12 and 16 beds. Wow. And we hope to even expand that further um, with another uh, possibility of additional capital funding and see what else mm -hmm. we can do. So that's, you said 12 to 16 beds in Mason County yes. and how many beds here at this particular? This facility only has 10, 10 beds. Right. It's unfortunate we were sort of constrained by funding and just the size of this building. Uh, the building itself is being provided by uh, Thurston County. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other facilities we, own, uh, we do own um, as a BHO and that includes then uh, the evaluation treatment facility that has 15 involuntary beds and mm -hmm. 10 uh, stabilization beds. Mm -hmm. That's the extent of for inpatient. Other than that, then we go out to hospital settings wow. for um, inpatient treatment. Wow. There's a lot going on in Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization, whether it be with uh, the law and justice system or the community as a whole or just special programs that you and your staff run. And uh, mm -hmm. I cannot thank you enough for what you do Happy to. in terms of bringing uh, care and love to the community in term with the mental health yes. issues that are going on. It's a crisis in a lot of times, and uh, you're on the front line of keeping people um, the best you can. So thank you so much for what you do. Happy to. Thank right, you. I want to take a, a very special moment to thank the uh, guests that have uh, come today to speak about the Triage Center and um, particularly the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization here in Thurston County and Mason County. I'm Commissioner Bob Lake. Thank you for watching Thurston County Connections.